Welcome to the lecture entitled, The Subjective Nature of Theory Choice. I'm Andrew Chapman. In this lecture, we'll cover seven topics. One, what a scientific theory is and does. Two, the underdetermination of scientific theory by empirical evidence. Three, Kuhn's historical study of science. Four, questions concerning theory choice. Five, what theoretical virtues are and how they are used. Six, subjectivity in theory choice, subjectivity in everything. And seven, the relation between subjectivity, rationality, and science. The central goal of science is to promote understanding of the natural world, and this understanding is achieved via explanations of natural phenomena, and these explanations further allow for predictions of future phenomena. Scientific theories are large-scale explanations of phenomena in general. Theories are sets of sentences and are created by scientists. However, theories are only true and hence only accurately explain if they correctly describe reality as it actually is, apart from anyone's mere beliefs about reality. The goal of scientific theorizing is to create theories that accurately describe the widest range of phenomena using as few explanatory facts as possible. Theories are large-scale explanations of phenomena in general. Thus, all theories are explanations. However, generally, when we use the term scientific explanation, we aren't referring to a theory. We just use the term theory to refer to theories. Scientific explanations are generally what we call small-scale explanations of specific phenomena. So, for example, while we could provide a scientific explanation of why the pencil fell by citing gravity, we could provide a theory of gravity in order to explain how and why gravity works as it does in all cases. While we could provide an explanation of why the members of some population have the phenotypic characteristics they do by citing biological evolution, we could provide a theory of evolution in order to explain how and why evolution works as it does in all cases. Theories are explanatory items and thus are not mere descriptive items. A simple list of all the things that had happened or would happen might teach us a lot, but that list would not be a theory, since it would explain nothing. A theory would explain why the items on that list were on that list in the first place. One thing that all successful theories have made use of, and that it seems that any theory must make use of, is what's known as theoretical entities. Theoretical entities are non-empirical entities that are not directly testable and that are necessary components of the theories that they're embedded in. These theoretical entities are what allow theories to be more than mere descriptive devices. Theoretical entities allow theories to explain why the facts are the way they are. They allow theories to get behind and underneath the merely empirical in order to make claims about the structure of reality. For any set of empirical evidence, even if it's 
all of the empirical evidence in the universe, and that evidence is possessed by an infinitely powerful mind, there will be no scientific theory that is uniquely determined by that evidence. What this means is that for any theory and any set of empirical evidence, that empirical evidence will underdetermine that theory. The empirical evidence is not enough to ensure the truth of that theory alone. The theory could still be false given all of that empirical evidence. And since underdetermination and overdetermination as concepts are related in the specific way that they are, the fact that empirical evidence underdetermines theories also means that theories overdetermine empirical evidence. There's more content in a theory than the merely empirical, and so the merely empirical can't uniquely determine any specific theory. Here is an illustration of the concept of the underdetermination of scientific theory by empirical evidence. Imagine that we have a set of all of the empirical evidence. Given this particular set of empirical evidence, there will be different theories, call them theory 1, theory 2, theory 3, and these theories are different in that they say different things about the world. However, given this set of empirical evidence, it might be the case that theory 1 is true, it might be the case that theory 2 is true, it might be the case that theory 3 is true. So empirical evidence underdetermines theories. Theory 1, theory 2, and theory 3 are consistent with that empirical evidence, even though they say different things about the world. What this also means is that theory 1, theory 2, and theory 3 overdetermine the empirical evidence. There's more content in these theories than simply the empirical. The fact that necessarily any possible scientific theory is underdetermined by any possible set of empirical evidence means that, given any set of empirical evidence, that evidence won't be enough to tell us whether that theory is true. Said another way, the underdetermination of theory by empirical evidence means that for any set of empirical evidence, there will be many, in fact infinitely many, distinct scientific theories that that evidence is equally good evidence for. That is, for any set of empirical evidence, that evidence alone will give us equally good reason to believe that each of an infinitely large set of distinct theories is true. And in terms of overdetermination, for any scientific theory, that theory will contain more than what is in the empirical evidence. It more than accounts for, more than makes sense of, more than explains that set of empirical evidence. For any empirical evidence, a scientific theory does its explanatory job with respect to explaining that evidence, and then it does more. It's important to remember that it's not as though underdetermination is a problem of data collection or a problem of mental abilities. It's not as though we just don't have all the data yet or we're just not smart enough. Underdetermination would even be an issue for an infinite mind with all possible empirical evidence. Thus, necessarily, all scientific theories are underdetermined by empirical evidence. There's a simple and obvious reason why all scientific theories are underdetermined by the empirical. Scientific theories contain more than merely empirical content. 
All scientific theories make reference to the necessarily non-empirical. So even if all of the empirical evidence we had could fully determine the empirical components of some theory, there are still many non-empirical components of that theory that are entirely untouched by our empirical evidence. The relationship between a theory and empirical evidence is that the theory is invented to make sense of the empirical evidence, and the empirical evidence supports the theory. But, necessarily, a theory always accounts for more than the specific empirical evidence, and the empirical evidence is always evidentially inadequate for the theory. There are a number of important consequences for the fact that scientific theories are necessarily underdetermined by empirical evidence. The most important consequences for our purposes here concern the relationship between science and the epistemological theory known as empiricism. Since any set of empirical evidence gives equally good reason to believe any of an infinitely large set of theories, empirical evidence alone can't decide between the infinitely many competing empirically equivalent theories. Now given that scientists do in fact decide between the infinitely many competing empirically equivalent theories, either scientists are not, and never have been, empiricists, or scientists have no good reason to choose between the theories they do. Clearly, scientists have reasons for choosing between the theories they do. We can ask scientists, why did you choose this theory over this theory, even though these two theories make equally good sense of the empirical evidence, and scientists can tell us. Enter philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn. Kuhn, in addition to being a philosopher of science, was also a physicist and a historian. His most famous treatise, entitled The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, is perhaps the most famous and controversial work in all of the philosophy of science. One of the things that interested Kuhn about the history of science was how scientists in fact decide between competing theories when the empirical evidence is not enough to decide for them. Kuhn is famous for having offered a radically revisionist theory of the history of science in which the paradigm-boundedness of the history of science entails that there are no overarching standards of rationality or truth, there is no scientific progress, and scientists never actually see the world objectively. Kuhn makes a study of the history of science in order to argue for that theory. However, it's important for us to recognize that there's a distinction to be made between Kuhn's revisionist radical theory and Kuhn's study of the history of science. We can appreciate the historical work that Kuhn has done, especially in terms of how scientists actually act when performing scientific work, without needing to accept or even deal with the theory that Kuhn claims is justified by his historical study. In this lecture, we'll be looking at Kuhn's claims about how scientists in fact do their work with respect to choosing between competing theories, and we won't be paying very much attention at all to Kuhn's theory about the paradigm boundedness of the history of science. According to philosopher of science Dudley Shapir, Kuhn's book calls attentions to many mistakes that have been made regarding the good reasons for scientific change. 
We must, as philosophers of science, shape our views of the development and structure of scientific thought in the light of what we learn from science and its history. The philosophy of science is unfortunately rife with theories about scientific methodology that were created from the armchair. While it's true that it is philosophers and not scientists who are performing the supportive and critical work of the discipline of science, one might think that it would be very difficult to perform this supportive work if one didn't have a keen understanding of the everyday practices involved in scientific theorizing, data collection, and testing. Now that's not to make the claim that scientists know more about science than philosophers do. That's a serious misunderstanding of the distinction between science and the philosophy of science. What this is to say is that philosophers who study X should at least take a look at what those who are practicing X are up to, even if those practitioners are totally wrong and misguided. Kuhn's philosophizing about science starts from actually observing what practicing scientists are up to. Thus, Kuhn's first step as a philosopher of science is to be a historian of science, a sociologist of science, and a psychologist of science. The central methodological difference between philosophy on the one hand and history, sociology, and psychology on the other hand is that the central evidence of philosophy is a priori, or non-empirical, while the central evidence of history, sociology, and psychology is a posteriori, or empirical. Philosophers are concerned with essences, while historians, sociologists, and psychologists are concerned with the contingent facts that have in fact occurred or that are currently occurring. Given the fact of the underdetermination of theory by empirical evidence, we know that even if we had all possible empirical evidence, we still could not tell which scientific theory to accept, since any set of empirical evidence is consistent with infinitely many different scientific theories. Even further, however, empirical evidence alone never tells us how to use that evidence. Evidence doesn't come prepackaged with a manual of how to apply that evidence. Which theories are acceptable and which aren't, given any set of empirical evidence, can only be determined by some prior commitment to accept theories that treat empirical evidence in some specific way. These prior commitments don't come from the evidence itself. Thus, we philosophers of science who are interested in how scientists in fact choose between competing theories have three questions that present themselves to us. First, how do scientists choose between competing theories? Call this the descriptive question, since it's interested in what in fact occurs in scientific practice. Second, what is the most rational way to choose between competing theories? Call this the epistemic question, in that it's interested in which epistemic standards are relevant to theory choice. Finally, how ought scientists to choose between competing theories. Call this the normative question in that it's concerned with best practices, what ought to be the case. And notice that the epistemic question and the normative question are separate questions. The amount of rationality, the level of rationality that is required for correct theory choice is something that we need to discuss.
what is it that makes a specific scientific theory a good one? Well, says Kuhn, what I ask to begin with are the characteristics of a good scientific theory. Among a number of quite usual answers, I select five, not because they're exhaustive, but because they are individually important and collectively sufficiently varied to indicate what is at stake. First, a theory should be accurate within its domain, that is, consequences deducible from a theory should be in demonstrated agreement with the results of existing experiments and observations. Second, a theory should be consistent, not only internally or with itself, but also with other currently accepted theories applicable to related aspects of nature. Third, it should have broad scope. In particular, a theory's consequences should extend far beyond the particular observations, laws, or sub-theories it was initially designed to explain. Fourth, and closely related, it should be simple, bringing order to phenomena that in its absence would be individually isolated and, as a set, confused. Fifth, a somewhat less standard item, but one of special importance to actual scientific decisions, a theory should be fruitful of new research findings. It should, that is, disclose new phenomena or previously unnoted relationships among those already known. Theoretical virtues are things that good theories have and that bad theories lack. Given a choice between two theories, a scientist ought to choose the theory with more theoretical virtues, since this is the better theory. Kuhn gives us a list of five theoretical virtues that seem relatively uncontroversial. Accuracy, consistency, scope, simplicity, and fruitfulness. Now notice that it's not just truth that makes a theory good. A lot more goes into deciding which theories ought to be adopted than whether they are simply true. However, it's important to note that whether something is a theoretical virtue always requires articulation. Nothing can simply be taken for granted when discussing criteria for theory choice. Even whether a theory should be accurate is something that we must make explicit. All right, well, since we know what theoretical virtues are in general, and we have a picture of some of the theoretical virtues, how are theoretical virtues used by scientists? Well, says Kuhn, when scientists must choose between competing theories, Two men fully committed to the same list of criteria for theory choice may, nevertheless, reach different conclusions. Perhaps they interpret simplicity differently, or have different convictions about the range of fields within which the consistency criterion must be met. Or, perhaps they agree about these matters but differ about the relative weights to be accorded to these or to other criteria when several are deployed together. With respect to divergences of this sort, no set of choice criteria yet proposed is of any use. One can explain, as the historian characteristically does, why particular men made particular choices at particular times. But for that purpose, one must go beyond the list of shared criteria to characteristics of the individuals who make the choice. One must, that is, deal with characteristics which vary from one scientist to another without thereby in the least jeopardizing their adherence to the canons that makes science scientific. Thus, Kuhn is saying, no simply objective list of theoretical virtues will be enough to tell us how scientists 
should behave or to explain how scientists have in fact behaved. We need to appeal instead to characteristics of individual scientists who make these choices. Even though Kuhn's list of theoretical virtues seems uncontroversial and about as straightforward as possible, we immediately encounter two problems. First, reasonable scientists and philosophers can disagree about which of two competing theories is, for example, simpler. Second, these theoretical virtues sometimes or even often conflict with one another such that, for example, a more accurate theory might be less fruitful. What do reasonable scientists actually do in these sorts of cases? It seems as though no objective normative standards have or can be identified for weighing the theoretical virtues against one another or for determining their correct application. One might even doubt that there are such normative standards at all. Certainly in the past, in the absence of such identified standards, scientists have made do by subjectively weighing and applying these criteria, rather than by appealing to some objective weighted list of their normative import. Now, Kuhn isn't just making an observation about the existence of subjective standards in science. He's giving us an argument. We can formalize something like what Kuhn is saying as follows. 1. Scientists do in fact use subjective standards when making decisions about theory choice. 2. Science has in fact been very successful. Thus, Science has in fact been very successful in part because of the subjective standards used by scientists. 4. It's impossible for scientists not to employ subjective standards when making decisions about theory choice. 5. Science requires making decisions about theory choice. Thus, 6. Science requires subjective standards. 7. If science has been successful in part because of subjective standards, and if science requires subjective standards, then there is certainly nothing wrong with employing subjective standards in science. Therefore, our conclusion, there's nothing wrong with employing subjective standards in science. Scientists both have done it and must do it because there's no alternative. Science is a human enterprise invented and practiced by humans for humanly goals. Even if the goal of science is to understand the world as it actually is, it will always be humans who are attempting to understand the world as it actually is. Whenever humans do anything, not just science, the choices that they make from the smallest to the biggest are, of course, made by humans. Even apparently simple choices like whether a scientific instrument reads X or Y is still determined by a human. Thus, all human activities ultimately bottom out in subjective human experience as that experience plays into the choices made by the humans engaging in those activities. So it's not just theory choice, and it's not just science that bottom out in subjectivity. Everything that humans do bottoms out in subjectivity. 
Now, of course, this doesn't mean something silly like there's no objective world, there's no such thing as objectivity or truth. That's the foolish argumentative mistake that's made by postmodernists. But what this does mean is that subjectivity is the foundation of everything that we do, and it's impossible to escape from this subjectivity while being humans. Thus, the only choice that we have is to embrace that this is how we do in fact work, this is how we have to work, and we can't pretend otherwise. The traditional picture of science, especially the picture given to us by the logical positivists and logical empiricists, held that science was only rational insofar as science was objective, and that further, science was only acceptable if it was being rational. Now, Kuhn is claiming that there's nothing wrong with using subjective standards in science, both because subjective standards have in fact made science very successful, and because it would be impossible not to use subjective standards. Thus, what Kuhn is saying is clearly at odds with the traditional picture of science. Kuhn, then, is telling us at least one of the following two things, and perhaps he's telling us both. Rationality and subjectivity are not at odds with one another. Thus, rationality doesn't require objectivity, and subjective standards can be rational standards. Rationality is not required for science. Thus, science can and does function perfectly well without a commitment to practicing science in a way determined by rationality. Thus, we can see what Kuhn's answers would be to our three questions concerning theory choice. The descriptive question, how do scientists choose between competing theories, Kuhn says, by making liberal use of subjective standards. The epistemic question, what is the most rational way to choose between competing theories, Kuhn's answer, who cares? The normative question, how ought scientists to choose between competing theories, Kuhn's answer, exactly as they are and have been, by making liberal use of subjective standards. In this lecture, we've looked at seven topics. One, what a scientific theory is and does. Two, the underdetermination of scientific theory by empirical evidence. Three, Kuhn's historical study of science. Four, questions concerning theory choice. Five, what theoretical virtues are and how they are used. Six, subjectivity in theory choice, subjectivity in everything. And 7. The relation between subjectivity, rationality, and science. Thank you.